Hello, hello, hello. This is this is Flirtations. We're doing our Flirtations Live to Tape podcast. We are currently reading the Junior Classics Volume Two. Uh, this Volume Two focuses on folk tales and myths. So I'm going to start off. We're going to read the notes. I should uh, note that this is, you know, the original text, the original uh, Junior Classics. So some of it might not be politically correct, but we're still going to read it. Uh, we're not going to do so much editing on the fly or anything like that. So this is going to be unabridged. So here we go. Oh, and the thing I, I should say is that uh, the photography we're going to be seeing as the visual background for this visual audiobook is uh, photographs from Alaska. Uh, you can purchase any of the photographs you see on this uh, visual audiobook by going to www.photationsstore.com and uh, there will be more info as we stream. So, without that, let's get started. Can you gotta get comfortable. So here we go with the Junior Classics Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. So this is the note. The characters of the contents of Volume 1, 2, and 3 is so closely related that they may be said to constitute three volumes under one general title. There are myths of Greece and Rome in this volume as well as in Volume 3, and there are more animal myths in Volume 1, particularly of the Hindus and of the North American Indians. What gives the volume a special character is the large group of stories from the saga or empire songs of the Northmen including the story of Brunhilde and Seyfried, and particular attractive versions of Lohengrid condensed, but not rewritten from the story of Miss Maud. These stories belong to us in a very particular sense, since the blood that flows in the veins of English and American boys is largely the blood of the fair-faced, fair-haired Northmen or Scandinavian or Danes or whatever we call them, who invaded England in the ninth and 10th century. Their strong bodies and strong wills have worked wonders in the world and have made the world a pleasanter place to live in. It was the Norseman blood that sent Robinson Crusoe a wandering and helped Christians defeat the giant Doubting Castle. The Norseman story of how it all began by E. M. Wilmont Brexton. Once upon a time, before ever this world was made, there was neither earth nor sea, nor air nor light, but only a great yawning gulf of full twilight. To the north of this gulf lay the home of mist, a dark dreary land out of which flowed a river of water from a spring that never ran dry, as the water in its onward course met the bitter blast of wind from the yawning gulf, it hardened into great blocks of ice, which rode far down into the abyss with a thunderous roar and piles themselves one on another until they formed mountains of glistening ice. South of this gulf lay the home of fire, a land burning heat guarded by a giant with flaming sword, which as he flashed it to and fro became the entrance sent forth flowers of sparks and these sparks fell upon the ice blocks and partly melted them, so that they sent up a cloud of steam, and these again were frozen in horror frost, which filled all the space which was left in the midst of the mountains of ice. Then one day, when the gulf was full to the very top, the great mass of frost rime, warmed by the flames from the home of fire, and frozen by the cold airs from the home of mist, came to life, and became the giant Yermir, with a living, moving body and a cruel heart of ice. Now there was as yet no tree, no grass, nor anything that would serve for food in this gloomy abyss. But when the giant Yermer began to grope around for something to satisfy his hunger, he heard a sound of some animals chewing the cud, and there amongst the ice hills he saw a gigantic cow from whose udders flowed the great steams of milk, and with this his cravings was easily stilled. But the cow was hungry also, and began to lick the salt off the blocks of ice by which it was surrounded, and presently as she went on licking with her strong rough tongue and head of hair pushed itself through the melting ice, still the cow went on licking until she had at last melted all the icy covering, and there stood fully revealed 
the frame of a mighty man. Yermer looked with eyes of hatred at the being, born of snow and ice, for somehow he knew that his heart was warm and kind, and that he and his sons would always be the enemies of the evil race of the frost giants. So indeed it came to pass, for the sons of Yermer came a race of giants who pleasure was to work evil on the earth, and from the sons of the ice men spring the race of the gods, chief of whom was Odin, father of all things that made that ever was made, and Odin and his brothers began at once to war against the wicked frost giants, and most of all against the cold hearted Yermer. Now and then, after a hard fight, the giant Yermer was slain, such a river of blood flowed forth from his wounds that it drowned all the rest of the frost giants save one, who escaped in a boat only with his wife on board, and sailed away to the edge of the world, and from his and from him sprang all the new race of frost giants, who at every opportunity issued from their land of twilight and desolation to harm the gods in their abode of bliss. When the giants had been thus driven out, all Father Odin set to work with his brothers to make the earth, the sea, and the sky, and these they fashioned out of the great body of the giant Yermer. Out of his flesh they formed Midgard, the earth which lay in the center of the gulf, and all around it they planted his eyebrows to make a high fence which would defeat, defend it from the race of giants. With his bones they made lofty hills, and his teeth the cliffs, and his thick curly hair took root and became trees and bushes and the green grass. With his blood they made the ocean, and his great skull poisoned aloft became the arching sky just below they scattered his brains and made them the heavy gray clouds that lie between the earth and heaven the sky itself was held in place by four strong dwarfs who supported on their broad shoulders as they stand east and west and south and north the next thing was to give the light to the new-made world so the gods caught sparks from the home of fire and set them in the sky for stars and they took the living flame and made of it the sun and moon, which they placed in chariots of gold and harnessed to themselves, and harnessed to them beautiful horses with flowing manes of gold and silver. Before the horses of the sky they made a mighty shield to protect them from the hot rays, but the swift moon stead needed no such protection from its gentle heat. And now all was ready to save that there was no one to drive the horses of the moon and the sun and moon. This task was given to Manny and Sol, the beautiful son and daughter of a giant, and these were fair charioteers, drive their fleet steed along the pass marked out by the god, and not only give light to the earth, but also mark out months and days for the sons of men. The all-father Odin called out forth night, the gloomy daughter of the cold hearted giant folk, and set her to drive the dark chariot drawn by the black horse, frosty mane, from whose long wavy hair the drop of dew and horse frost fall upon the earth below fall upon the earth below. After her after her drove her radiant sun day with this white steed shining mane, from whom the bright beams of daylight shone forth to gladden the heart of men. But the wicked giant were very angry. I got my dog going. But the wicked, but the wicked giant. Uh, hold on, I'll, I'll be right back. Uh, maybe she stopped. But the wicked giants were very angry when they saw all these good things. And they set into the sky two hungry wolves. I'll be back. I'll be back.
But the wicked giants were very angry when they saw all these good things, and they set in the sky two hungry wolves, that their fierce great creatures might forever pursue the sun and moon and devour them, and so bring all things to an end. Sometimes indeed, or so they say, the men of the north, the gray wolves, almost succeeded in swallowing the sun or moon, and the, then the earth children made such an uproar that the fierce beasts dropped their prey in fear, and the sun and moon flee more rapidly, rapidly than before, still pursued by the hungry monsters. One day runs the late as Manny, the man of the moon, was hastening on his course, he gazed upon the earth and saw two beautiful little children, a boy and a girl, carrying between them a pail of water. They looked very tired and sleepy, and indeed they were, for a cruel giant made them fetch and carry water all night long when they should have been in bed. So Manny put out a long, long arm and snatched up the children and set them in the moon, pale and all, and there you can see them on any moonlight night for yourself. But that happened a long time ago, the beginning of things, for as yet there was no man or woman or child upon the earth. And now that these pleasant Midgard and now that this pleasant Midgard was made, the gods determined to satisfy their desire for a home where they might rest and enjoy themselves in their hours of ease. They chose a suitable place far above the earth, on the other side of the great river, which flowed from the home of mist where the giants dwelt, and here they made their abode, Asgard, wherein they dwelt in peace and happiness, and from whence they could look down upon the sons of men. From Asgard to Midgard they built a beautiful bridge of many colors, to which men gave the name Rainbow, name of Rainbow Bridge, and up and down which the gods could pass on their journeys to and from the earth. Here in Asgard stood the mighty forge, where the gods fashioned their weapons, wherein they fought the giants, and the tools within they built their places of gold and silver. Meantime no human creature lived upon the earth, and the giants dared not cross its borders for fear of the gods, but one of them, clad in eagle plumes, always sat at the north side of Midgard, and whenever he raised his arms and let them fall again, an icy blast rushed forth the mist home and nipped all the pleasant things of earth with its cruel breath. In due time, the earth brought forth thousands of tiny creatures which crawled about and showed signs of great intelligence, and when the gods examined these little people closely, they found that they were of two kinds. Some were ugly, mishappened, and cunning-faced with great heads, small bodies, long arms, and feet. They were called trolls of dwarf or gnomes, and they sent them to live underground, threatening to turn them into stones should they appear in the daytime. And this is why the trolls spend all their time in hidden parts of the earth, digging for gold and silver, and precious stones, and hiding their spoils away in secret holes and corners. Sometimes they blow their tiny fighters and set to work to make all kinds of wonderful things from this buried treasure, and that is what they are doing when, if no one listens, very hard on the mountains and hills of the Northland, and sound of tap-tap-tapping is heard far underneath the ground. The other small earth creatures were very fair and light and slender. Kindly the heart of the full of go- good will, these gods called fairies or elves, and gave them a charming place called Elfland, in which to dwell. Elfland lies between Asgard and Midgard, and since all fairies have wings, they can easily flit down to earth to play with the butterflies, teach the young birds to sing, and water the flowers or dance in the moonlight around a fairy ring. Last of all, the gods made a man and a woman to dwell in fair Midgard, and this is the manner of their creation. All Father Odin was walking with his brothers in Midgard 
where by the sea shore they found growing two trees, an ash and an elm. Odin took these trees and breathed on them, whereupon a wonderful transformation took place. Where the trees had stood, there was a living man and a woman, but they were stupid, pale, and speechless, until Honir, the god of light, touched their foreheads and gave them a sense of gave them sense and wisdom and loki the fire god smoothed their faces giving them bright color and warm blood and the power to speak and to see and hear it only remained that they should be named and they were called ask and embella the names of the trees from which they had been formed from these two people sprang all the races of men which lives upon this earth and now all father odin completed his work by planting the tree of life this immense tree had its roots in asgard and midgard and the midst lands as it grew to such a marvellous height that the highest brow of the bow of peace hung over the hall of odin on the heights of asgard and the other branches overshadowed both midgard and the mist land on the top of the peace br- peace bro was perched a mighty eagle and ever a falcon sat between his eyes and kept watch on all that happened in the world below that he might tell odin what he saw hydrum the goat of odin who supplied the heavenly mead browsed on the leaves of this wonderful tree and from them fed also four mighty stags from whose horns honey-dew dropped on the earth beneath and supplied water for all the rivers of midgard the leaves of the tree of life were ever green and fair despite the dragon which aided by countless serpents gnawed perpetually at its roots in order that they might kill the tree of life and thus bring about the destruction of the gods up and down the branches of the tree scampered the squirrel ratistock a malicious little creature whose one amusement is to make mischief by repeating to the eagle the rude remarks of the dragon and to the dragon those of the eagle in the hope that one day he might see them in an actual conflict near the roots of the tree of life is a sacred well of sweet water from which the three weird sisters who know all that shall come to pass sprinkle the tree and keep it fresh and green and the water as it trickles down from the leaves falls as drops of honey on earth and the bees take it for their blood close to this sacred well is the council hall of the gods to which every morning they rode over the bridge to hold converse together and this is the end of the tale of how all things began how the queen of the sky gave gifts to men by e m wilmot buxton by the end of all father odin upon his high seat in asgard sat frigga his wife the queen of the ss sometimes she would be dressed in snow-white garments bound by the waist in a golden girdle from which hung a great bunch of golden keys and the earth dwellers gazed into the sky and would admire the great white clouds as they floated across the blue not perceiving that these clouds were actually really the folds of frigga's white flowing robe as it waved in the wind at other times she would wear dark gray or purple garments and then the earth dwellers made haste into their houses for they said the sky is lowering to-day and a storm is night at hand is nigh at hand frigga had a place of her own called fenslayer or hall of mists where she spent much of her time at her wheel spinning golden thread or weaving web after web of many colored clouds all night long she sat at the golden wheel and if you look at the sky on a starry night you may chance to see it get set up where the men of the south show a constellation called the griddle of orion husbands and wives who have dwelt lovingly together upon earth were invited by frigga to the hall where they died so they might forever united within its hospitable walls frigga was especially interested in all good housewives as she herself set them an excellent example of fenceleer when the snowflakes fell the earth dwellers knew 
It was Frigga shaking her head, her great feather bed, and when it rained, they said it was her washing day. It was she who gave them the gift of flax that the women upon earth might spin and weave and bleach their linen as white as the clouds of her own white robe. And this is how it came about. There was once a shepherd who lived among the mountains with his wife and children, and so very poor was he that he often found it hard to give his family enough to satisfy their hunger. But he did not grumble, he only worked the harder, and his wife, though she had scarcely any furniture and never a chance of new dress, kept the house so clean and the cl old clothes so well mended that all unknown to herself she rose high in the favor of the all-seeing Frigga. Now one day when the shepherd had driven his few poor sheep up the mountain to pasture, a fine reindeer sprang from the rocks above him and began to leap upward along the steep slope. The shepherd snatched up his crossbow and pursued the animal, thinking to himself, Now we shall have a better meal than we have had for many a long day. Up and up leaped the reindeer, always just out of reach, and at a length disappeared behind a great boulder, just as the shepherd, breathless and weary, reached the spot. No sign of the reindeer was to be seen, but on looking around, the shepherd saw that he was among the snowy heights of the mountains, and almost at the top of a great glacier. Presently, as he pursued his vain search for the animal, he saw to his amazement an open door leading apparently into the heart of the glacier. He was a fearless man, and so without hesitation he passed boldly through the doorway and found himself standing in a marvelous cavern lit upon the blazing torches which gleamed upon rich jewels hanging from the roof and walls, and in the midst stood a woman, most fair to behold, clad in snow-white robes, surrounded by a group of lovely maidens. The shepherd's boldness gave way at this awesome sight, and he sank to his knees before Asia Frigga, for she it was. But Frigga bade him be of good cheer, and said, Choose now whatsoever you will to carry away with you as a remembrance of this place. The shepherd's eyes wandered over the glittering jewels on the walls and roof, but then came back to a little bunch of blue flowers which Frigga held in her hand. They alone looked homelike to him. The rest were hard and cold, so he asked timely that he might be given a little nosegay. Then Frigga smiled kindly upon him. Most wise has been your choice, said she. Take the flowers, this measure of seed, and sow it into your field and you shall grow flowers of your own. They shall bring prosperity to you and yours. So they, so the shepherd took the flowers and the seeds, and scarcely had he done so when a mighty peal of thunder followed by the shock of an earthquake rent the cavern, and when he had collected his senses, he found himself once more upon the mountain side. When he reached home, he had told his tale. His wife scolded him roundly for not bringing home a jewel which would have made them rich forever, but when she would have thrown the flowers away, he prevented her. The next day he sowed the seed in his field, and was surprised to find how far it went. Soon, Very soon after, this field was thick with tiny green shoots, and though his wife reproached him for wasting good round upon useless flowers, he watched and waited in hope until his field was blue with starry flax bloom, blooms. Then one night, when the flowers had withered and the seed was ripe, Frugga, in the disguise of an old woman, visited the lowly hut and showed the shepherd and his astonished wife how to use the flax stalks, how to spin them into a thread, and how to weave the thread into linen. It was not long before all the dwellers in that part of the earth had heard the wonderful material and were hurrying to the shepherd's hut to buy bleached linen or the seed from which they from which it was obtained and so the shepherd and his family were soon upon the richest people in the land and the promise of frigga was amplified was amply fulfilled the dwarfs and the fairies by a and e curry 
The earth is very beautiful, said Odin, from the top of his throne, very beautiful in every part, even to the shores of the dark north seas. But alas, the men of the earth are very puny and fearful. At this moment I see three-headed giants striding out of Jordanheim. He throws a shepherd boy into the sea and puts the whole of his flock in his pocket. Now he takes them out again, one by one, and cracks their bones as if they were hazelnuts, whilst all the time the men look on and do nothing. Father cried Thor in rage. Last night I forged myself a belt and glove and a hammer with which these things I will go forth alone to Jotunheim. Thor went, and Odin looked again. The men of the earth are idle and stupid, said Odin. They are dwarves and elves who live amongst men, who live amongst them, and play tr tricks which they cannot understand and do not know how to prevent. At this moment I see a, hus a husbandman sowing grains of wheat in the furrows, while a dwarf runs after him and changes them into stones. Again I see two hideous little beings who are holding under the water the head of one of the wisest of men until he dies. They mix his blood with honey. They have it put into three stone jars and hidden it away. Then Odin was very angry with the dwarves, for he saw that they were bent on mischief, so he called to him Hermod, his flying word, and dispatched him with a message to the dwarves and the light elves to say that Odin sent his compliments and would be glad to speak with them in his palace of Gladheim upon a matter of some importance. When they received Hermod's summons, the dwarfs and the light elves were very much surprised, not quite knowing whether to feel honored or afraid. However, they put on their perspicuous manners and went clustering after Hermod like swarms of ladybirds. When they were arrived in the great city, they found Odin descended from his throne and sitting with the rest of Ilsnir in the judgment hall of Gladenheim, Hermod flew in, saluted his master, and pointed to the dwarves and elves, hanging like a cloud in the doorway to show that he had fulfilled his mission. Then Odin beckoned the little people to come forward. Cowering and whispering, they peeped over one another's shoulders, now running on a little way into the hall, now back again, half the curious, half afraid, and it was not until Odin had beckoned three times that they finally reached his footstool. Then Odin spoke to them in calm, low, serious tones about the wickedness of their mischievous prosperities. Some, the most worst of them, only laughed in a forward-hardened manner, but a great many looked up surprised and a little pleased at the novelty of the serious words, while the light elves all wept, for they were tender-hearted little things. At length Odin spoke to the two dwarves, by name whom he had seen, drowning the wise man, Whose blood was it, he asked, that you mixed with the honey and put into jars? Oh, said the dwarves, jumping into the air and clapping their hands, that was Kalsvir's blood. Don't you know who Kalsvir is? Who Kalsvir was? He sprang up out of the peace made between the Vanirs and yourself, and has been wandering about these seven years or more. So wise was he that men thought he must be a god. Well, you know... Well, just now we found him lying in a meadow, drowned in his own wisdom. So we mixed his blood with honey and put it into three great jars to keep. Was not that well done, Odin? Well done, answered Odin. Well done, you cruel, cowardly lying doors. I myself saw you kill him. For shame, for shame. And then Odin proceeded to pass a sentence upon them all. Those who had been the most wicked, he said, were to live henceforth a long way underground and were to spend their time in throwing fuel upon the great earth's central fire, whilst those who had only been mischievous were to work in the gold and diamond mines, fashioning precious stones and metals. They might all come up at night, Odin said, but must vanish at dawn. Then he waved his hand, and the dwarves turned round, shrilly chattering, and scampered down the palace steps, out of the city, over the green fields, to where their unknown buried deep earth homes. But the light elves still lingered, with upturned tearful smiles, 
like sunshine morning dew. And you, said Odin, looking them through and through with his serious eyes, and you. Oh, indeed, Odin, interrupted they, speaking all together in a quick, uncertain tones. Oh, indeed, Odin, was not very wicked. We have never done anybody any harm. Have you ever done anybody any good? asked Odin. Oh, no, indeed, answered the light elves. We have never done anything at all. You may go then, said Odin, to live among the flowers and play with the wild bees and summer insects. You must, however, find something to do, or you will get to be mischievous like the dwarfs. If only we had anyone to teach us, said the light elves, for we are such foolish little people. Odin looked round inquiringly upon the Esir, but among them there were no teachers found for the silly little elves. Then he turned to Norred, who nodded his head good-naturedly and said, Yes, yes, I will see about it, said, and then he strode off of the judgment hall, right away through the city gates, and sat down upon the mountain's edge. After a while he began to whistle, and the most alarming matter, louder and louder in strong wild gusts, now advancing, now retreating, then he dropped his voice a little, lower and lower, until it became a bird-like whistle, low, soft, enticing music, like the spirit call, and far away from the south a little flutter answer came, sweet as the invitation itself, nearer and nearer, until the two sounds dropped into one another, then through the clear sky, two forms made floating wonderfully fair, and a brother and a sister, their beautiful arms twined round another, their golden hair bathed in sunlight and supported by the wind. My son and daughter, said Norid, proudly to the surrounding Esir, Frey and Freya, summer and beauty, hand in hand. When Frey, when Frey and Freya dropped upon the hill, Norads took his son by the hand, led them gracefully to the foot of the throne, and said, Look here, dear brother lord, what a fair young instructor I have brought for your pretty little elves. Odin was very much pleased with the appearance of Frey, but before consulting him, king and schoolmaster of the light elves, he desired to know what his accomplishments were, and what he considered himself competent to teach. I am the genius of the clouds and sunshine, answered Frey, as, and as he spoke the essence of a hundred perfumes were exhaled from his breath. I am the genius of cloud and sunshine, and if the light elves would have me for their king, I can teach them how to burst the fold, folded buds and to set b blossoms of poor sweetness into the swelling fruit, to lead the bees through the honey passages of the flowers, to make the single ear a stalk of wheat, to hatch birds' eggs, and to teach the little ones to sing all this and much more, said Frey. I know and will teach them. Then answered Odin, It is well, and Frey took his scholar away with him to Alfheim, which is very, which is in very beautiful place under the sun. How Thor Went to Jotunheim by E. and E. Curry A. and E. Curry Once upon a time, as a Thor and Loki set out on a journey from Asgard to Jotunheim, they traveled in Thor's chariot, drawn by two milk-white goats. It was a somewhat cumbrous iron chariot. Draw it was a somewhat cumbrous iron chariot, and the wheels made a rumbling noise as it moved, which sometimes startled the ladies of Asgard and made them tremble. But Thor liked it, though the noise sweeter than any music was never so happy as when he was journeying in it from one place to another. They traveled all day, and in the evening they came to a countryman's house. It was a poor, lonely place, but Thor descended from his chariot and determined to pass the night there. The countryman, however, had no food in his house to give these travelers, and Thor, who liked to feast himself and make every one feast with him, was obliged to kill his own two goats and serve them up for supper. He invited the countryman and his wife and children to sup with him, but before they began to eat, he made one request to them. Do not on any account, he said, break or throw away any of the bones of the goat, 
you are going to eat for supper. I wonder why, said the peasant's son, Talif, to his sister, Roska. Roska could not think of any reason, and by and by, Tharif happened to have a very nice little bone given to him with some marrow in it. Certainly there can be no harm in my breaking just one, he said to himself. It would be such a pity to lose the marrow. And as Asathor's head was turned the other way, he slyly broke the bone in two and sucked the marrow and then threw the pieces into the goat's skin, where Thor had desired all the bones might be placed. I do not know whether Tarif was uneasy during the night about what he had done, but in the morning he found out that the reason Asathor's commanded and received a lesson on wondering why, which he never forgot all his life after. As soon as Azathor rose in the morning, he took his hammer, Molinir, in his hand, and held it over the goat skins as he lay on the floor, whispered runes the while, and their dead skin with dry bones on them, where he began to speak. But as he said the last word, Tarif, who was looking on curiously on, saw two live goats spring up and walk toward the chariot, as fresh and as well as they brought the chariot up to the door. Thalif hoped, but no. One of the goats limped a little with his hind leg, and as Thor saw it, he grew dark and he looked, and for a minute Thalif thought he would run afar, far into the forest, and never come back again. But one look more as Thor's face, angry as it was, made him change his mind. He thought of a better thing to do then running away, and came forward and threw himself at Isaiah's feet, and confessing what he had done, begged pardon for his disobedience. Thor listened, and the displeased look passed away from his face. You have done wrong, Thalif, he said, raising him up, but as you have confessed your fault so bravely, instead of punishing you, I will take you with me on my journey, and teach you myself the lesson of obedience to the Isaiah which is, I see, wanted. Roska chose to go with her brother, and from that day Thor had two faithful servants who followed him wherever he went. The chariot and goat were now left behind, but with Loki and his two new followers, Thor journeyed on to the end of Mannheim, over the sea, and then on and on and on in a strange, barren, misty land of Jotunheim. Sometimes they crossed great mountains, sometimes they had to make their way amongst the torn and rugged rocks, which often, though the mist appeared to them, to wear the forms of men, and once for a whole day they traversed a thick and tangled forest. In the evening of that day, being very much tired, they saw with pleasure that they had come upon a spacious hall, of which the door as broad as the house itself stood wide open. Here we may have very comfortable lodge for the night, said Thor, and they went in and looked about them. The house appeared to be perfectly empty. There was a wide hall and five smaller rooms opening into it. They were, however, too tired to examine it carefully, and as no inhabitants made their appearance, they ate their supper in the hall and lay down to sleep. But they not rested long before they were disturbed by strange noises and groanings and mutterings and snortings louder than any animal than that they had ever seen in their lives could make. By and by the house began to shake from side to side, and it seemed as if the very earth trembled. Thor sprang up in haste and ran to open the door, but though he looked earnestly into the starlit forest there was no enemy to which anywhere loki and therif after groping around for a time found a sheltered chamber to the right where they thought they could finish their night's rest in safety but thor with his molinier in his hand watched the door of the house all night as soon as the day dawned he went out into the forest and there stretched on the ground close by the house he saw a strange, uncouth, gigantic shape of man, whose nostrils came a breath which swayed the trees to their very tops. There was no need to wonder any longer what the disturbing noise had been. Thor fearlessly walked up 
this strange monster to have a better look at him, but at the sound of his footsteps, the giant shaped rose slowly, stood up at an immense height, and looked down upon him, d- down upon Thor, with two great misty eyes like blue mountain lakes. Who are you? said Thor, standing on tiptoe and stretching his neck to look up, and why do you make such a noise as to prevent your neighbors from sleeping? My name is Skrymir, said the giant sternly. I need not ask yours. You are the little as the Thor of Asgard. But pray now, what have you done with my glove? As he spoke, he stooped down and picked up the hall where Thor and his companions had been passing the night, and which in truth was nothing more than his glove, the room where Loki and Thalif had slept being the thumb. Thor rubbed his eyes and felt as if it must be dreaming. Rousing himself, however, he raised Mjolnir in his hand, and trying to keep his eyes fixed on the giant's face, which seemed to always be changing, he said, It is time that you should know, Skymir, that I am come to Jotunheim to fight and conquer such evil giants as you are, and, little as you think me, I am ready to try my strength against yours. Try it, then, said the giant, and Thor, without another word, threw Milner at his head. Ah, ah, said the giant, did you, a deaf touch me? Did a leaf touch me? Again Thor seized Milner, which always returned to his hand, however, far as he cast it from with him, and threw it with all his force. The giant put up his hand to his forehead. I think, he said, that an acorn must have fallen on my head. A third time Thor struck a blow, and the heaviest that ever fell from the hand of an Asa. But this time the giant laughed aloud. There is surely a bird on that tree, he said, who has left a feather fall on my face. Then, without taking any further notice of Thor, he swung an immense wallet over his shoulder, and turning his back upon him, struck into the path that led from the forest. When he had gone a little way, he looked round, his immense face appearing less and less like a human countenance that some strange, uncostly shaped stone toppling on a mountain piece. Ving Thor, he said, let me give you a piece of good advice before I go. When you get to the Utgard, do not make much of yourself. You think me a tall man, but you have taller still to see, and you yourself are a very little mankin. Turn back home, once you came, and be satisfied to have learned something of yourself by your journey to Jotunheim. Man can or not, that will never, that will I never do, shouted Azathor after the giant. We will meet again, and something more will we learn, or teach each other. The giant, however, did not turn back to answer, and Thor and his companions, after looking for some time after him, resumed their journey. Before the sun was quite high, in the heavens they came out of the forest, and at noon they found themselves on a vast barrel plain, where stood a great city whose walls of dark rough stone were so high that Thor had to bend his head quite far back to see the top of them. When they approached the entrance of the city, they found that the gates were closed and barred, but the space between the bars was so large that Thor passed through easily and his companions followed him. The streets of the city were gloomy and still. They walked on for some time without meeting anyone, but at length they came to a very high building of which the gates stood stood open. Let us go in and see what is going on here, said Thor, and they went. After crossing the threshold, they found themselves in an immense banquet hall, A table stretched from one end to the other of it. Stone thrones stood round the table, and on every throne sat a giant, each one, as Thor glanced round, appearing more grim and cold and stony than the rest. One among them sat on a raised seat, and appeared to be the chief, so to him Thor approached and paid his greetings. The giant chief just glanced at him, and without rising said, in a somewhat careless manner, it is, I think, a foolish custom to tease tired travelers with questions about their journey. 
I know without asking that you, little fellow, are Askathor. Perhaps, however, you may be in reality taller than you appear, and as it is a rule here that no one shall sit down to table till he has performed some wonderful feat, let us hear what you and your followers have farmed for, and in what way you choose to prove yourselves worthy to sit down in the company of giants. At this speech, Loki, who had entered the hall cautiously behind Thor, pushed himself forward. A feat for which I am most famed, he said, is eating, and it is one which I am just now inclined to perform with right good will. Put food before me, and let me see if any of your followers can dispatch it as quickly as I can. The feat you speak is of one by no means to be despised, said the Utgard king, and there is one here who would be glad to try his powers against yours. Let Logi and said to one of his followers, be summoned to the hall. At this a tall, thin, yellow-faced man approached a large and a large trough of meat having been placed in the middle of the hall. Loki sat down to work at one end, and Loki at the other, and they began to eat. I hope I shall never see any one eat as they ate, but the giants all turned their slow-moving eyes to watch them, and in a few minutes they met in the middle of the trough. It seemed at first that they had both eaten exactly the same quantity, but when the thing came to be examined into it, it was found that Loki had indeed eaten up all the meat but that Logi had also eaten the bones of the trough. So the giants nodded their huge heads, determined that Loki was conquered. King Utgar now turned to Saif and asked what he could do. I was thought swift on foot among the youth of my own country, answered Saif, and I will, if you please, try to run a race with anyone here. You have chosen a noble sport indeed, said the king, but you must be a good runner if you could beat him with whom I shall match you. Then he called a slender lad, Hungi, by name, and the whole company left the hall, and going out by the opposite gate to that which Thor had entered, they came out to an open space which had a noble race ground, and there the goal was fixed, and Thaif and Hungi, Hungi, started off together. Thief ran fast, fast as the reindeer which hears the fools howling behind, but Hungi ran so fast, so much faster, that passing the goal, he turned round and met Thief halfway in the course. Try again, Thief cried the king, and Thief once more taking his place, flew among the course, with his feet scarcely touching the ground, swiftly as an eagle when, from his mounting crag, he swooped on his prey in the valley, but with all his running, he was still a good bow shot from the goal when Hugi reached it. You are certainly a good runner, said the king, but if you mean to win, you must do a little better than this still. Perhaps you wish to surprise us all with this third time. The third time, however, Thaif was wearied, and though he did his best, Hungi, having reached the goal, turned and met him not far from the starting point. The giants again looked at each other and declared that there was no need for further trial, for Thaif was conquered. It was now Azzi Thor's turn, and all the company looked eagerly at him, while the Utgard king asked by which, by what wonderful feat he chose to distinguish himself. I will try a drinking match with any of you, Thor said shortly, for to tell the truth, he cared not to perform anything very worthy in company in which he found himself. King Utgard appeared pleased with this choice, and when the giants had resumed their seats in the hall, he ordered one of his servants to bring in his drinking cup, called the Cup of Penance, which it was his custom to make his guests drink, drain at a draught if they had broken any of the ancient rules of the society. There, he said, handing it to Thor, we call it well drunk if a person empties it at a single draught. Some indeed take two to it, but the very punist can manage it in three. Thor looked into the cup, and it appeared to him long 
but not so very large at all, and being thirsty, he put it to his lips, and though to make short work of it, and emptied it at one good hearty pull, he drank and put the cup down again, but instead of being empty, it was just so full that it could be moved without danger of spilling. Ha ha, you are keeping all your strength for the second pool, I see, said Ukard, looking in it without answering. Thor lifted up the cup again and drank with all his might till his breath failed. But when he put down the cup, the liquor had only sunk down a little from the brim. If you mean to take three draughts of it, said Uttar, you are really leaving yourself a very unfair share for the last time. Look to yourself, Vingthor, for if you do not acquit yourself better in other feats, we shall not think so much of you here as they say the Izir do in Asgard. At this speech, Thor fell very angry, and seizing the cup, he drank a third time, deeper and longer than that he had yet done. But when he looked into the cup, he saw the very small part had only of its contents disappeared. Weary and disappointed, he put the cup down and said he would try no more to empty it. It is pretty plain, said the king, looking round on the company, that Azar Thor is by no means the kind man we have always supposed him to be. Is by no means the kind of man we supposed him to be. Nay, said Thor, I am willing to try another feat, and you yourselves shall choose what it shall be. Well, said the king, there is a game in which our children are used to play. A short time ago, I dare not name it to Azathor, but now I am curious to see how he will acquit himself in it. It is merely to lift my cat from the ground, a childish amusement truly. As he spoke, a large gray cat sprang into the hall, and Thor, stooping forward, put his hands under it to lift it up. He tried gently at first, but the degree he put forth and all his strength, tugging and straining as he had never done before, but the utmost he could do was to raise one of the cat's paws a little way from the ground. It is just as I thought, said King Utgard, looking round with a smile, but we have, we are all willing to allow the cat is large, and Thor but a little fellow. Little as you think me, cried Thor, who there is, who is there will dare to wrestle with me in my anger? And truth, said the king, I don't think there is anyone here who would choose to wrestle with you. But if wrestle with you must, I will call in old crone Eli. She has in her time laid low many a better man than Azathor has shown himself to be. The crone came. She was old, withered, and toothless, and Thor shrank from the thought of wrestling with her, but he had no choice. She threw her arm around him and drew him toward the ground, and the harder he tried to free himself, the tighter grew her grasp. The struggling and long Thor strove bravely, but a strange feeling of weakness and weariness came over him, and at length he tottered and fell down on one knee before her. At this sight all the giants laughed aloud, and Utgard coming up, desired the old woman to leave the hall, and proclaimed that the trials were over. No one of his followers would now contend with Azathor, he said, at night was approaching. Then he invited Thor and his companions to sit down at the table and spend the night with him as his guest. Thor, though feeling somewhat perplexed and mortified, accepted this invitation courteously, and showed by his agreeable behavior during the evening that he knew how to bear being conquered with good grace. In the morning when Thor and his companions were leaving the city, the king himself accompanied them without the gates accompanied them without the gates, and Thor looking steadily at him when he turned to bid him farewell, perceived for the first time that he was the very same giant Skelmir with whom he had met in the forest. Come now, as a Thor, said the giant with some strange sort of smile on his face, tell me truly before you go how you think your journey has turned out, and whether or not I was right in saying that you would meet with better men than yourself in Jotunheim. I confess freely, answered Azathor, looking upon with 
out any false shame on his face, that I have indeed acquitted myself, but humbly, and that it grieves me, for I know that in Jotunheim henceforth it will be said that I am a man of little worth. By troth, no, cried the great giant heartily, never should you have come into my city, if I had known what a mighty man of valor you really are, and now that you are safely out of it, I will for once tell the truth to you, Thor. All this time I have been deceiving you by your deceiving you by my enchantments. When you met me in the forest, I hurled Molnir at my head. I stood I hurled Molnir at my head. It should have been crushed by the weight of your blows had not skilfully placed in a mountain between myself and you, on which the strokes of your hammer fell, but where your cleft three deep ravines have shall henceforth become verdant valleys. In the same manner I deceived you about the contest in which you engaged last night. When Loki and Logi sat down before the trough, Loki indeed ate like the hunger itself, but Logi is fire, with whom the eager consuming tongue looked up both bones and trough. Fahi is the swiftest of mortal runners, but the slender lad, Hugi, who was thought and was the speed, can equal his. So it was your own trials which you took such deep draught from the horn. You, li- you little knew that a wonderful feat you were performing. The other end of that trough reached to the ocean, and when you came... When you come to the shore, you will see how far it is, the waters have fallen away, and now much to the deep sea itself has been diminished by your draught. How it for hereafter men watching the going out of the tide will call it an ebb, the drought of Thor. Scarcely less wonderful was the prowess you displayed in the second trial. What appears to you to be a cat was in reality Midgard serpents who encircle the world. When they saw you succeeding in moving it, we trembled lest the very foundations of the earth and sea should be shaken by your strength. Nor need you be ashamed of having been overthrown by the old woman Eli, for she is an old age, and there never has and never will be any whom she has not the power to lay low. We must now apart, and you had better not come here again, or attempt anything further against my city, for I shall always defend it by my fierce enchantments, and you will never be able to do anything against me. At these words Thor raised Mjolnir, and was about to challenge the giant to a fresh trial of strength, but before he could speak, Ukkar vanished from his sight, and turning around to look for the city, he found that it too had disappeared, and that he was standing alone on a smooth, green, empty plain. Ah, what a fool I have been, said Azathor aloud, to allow myself to be deceived by a mounting giant. Ah, answered a voice from above, I told you you would learn to know yourself better by your journey to Jotunheim. It is great use of traveling. Thor turned quickly around, again thinking to see Skymir behind him, but after looking on every side, he could perceive nothing but that a high cloud-capped mountain which he had noticed on the horizon, appeared to have advanced to the edge of the plain. Well, that was it for this reading for the Life to Tape, uh, the Flotation's Life to Tape podcast. That was the Junior Classics Volume 1 uh, with Myth and Tales. I will uh, have to do a lot of these recordings kind of all at once, so I'll be doing them fairly often. Uh, I'll be posting this in podcast form, and uh, he'll also be posting to Twitter and YouTube. But I want to thank everyone for coming out. See everyone later. Bye-bye.